When traveling north up Highway 95, we find a bit of a pit stop right at the intersection of Highway 95 and Highway 93. This pit stop waves the New California Republic flag. This is the 188 Trading Post, and there's not much to see here. We find one bar, a small NCR presence, but a number of destitute travelers. If we explore underneath the overpass, we see a little nook to the southwest with a bunch of junk, a pre-war American flag, and then all sorts of stuff. A teddy bear, a basketball, baby carriage, picture frames, ruined books. And lying on a scrap of cardboard is a small boy who calls himself the Forecaster. Hello, ma'am. I hope you're doing fine today. Where are your parents, kid? Are you here all alone? I don't have a mama or papa anymore. I see them sometimes when I take off my medicine, but they can't stay. I'm pretty used to being on my own. He sees them when he takes off his medicine? What? Crazy kid. Well, maybe he's a merchant. Hey, kid, I'd like to see what you have for sale. Oh, I don't sell things, ma'am. I sell thoughts. You sell thoughts? I can take off my medicine and do some thinking. People say it's real interesting. I don't know, because I never hear it. Some people say that it's a gift. Other people say it's the kind of thinking anyone could do if they watched more than they talked. I don't know which is true. I see a lot. I think a lot. There's a lot to hear through the 188, too. That maybe accounts for the thinking. You don't sell any of that junk behind you? That's not junk. That's other people's thoughts. People had to think to make them, and the thoughts got stuck inside. I need other people's thoughts to fill my head when I'm not thinking myself. Otherwise, it's kind of empty. What is your medicine, and how do you take it off? This thing on my head is headache medicine. It works real good, except I can't think when it's on. Really think, I mean. That is an interesting doodad. I haven't seen anything like that before. Almost looks like a crown, but he calls it his headache medicine. I might be interested in buying your headache medicine. How much? Thinking hurts you too? Huh? I wish I could let you have the one on my head, but I can't. It hurts real bad when I don't wear it. So he gets headaches if he doesn't wear this thing. I wonder what it is. Well, all right, you have me intrigued. I'll pay 100 caps to hear your thoughts. Great. What do you want me to think about? I can think about you, here, or everywhere. What do you want? On second thought, maybe another time. I thought you'd say that. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> all right, you got me. That was funny. I'll buy some of your thoughts. Do your thinking about me. Okay. Let me take off my medicine. Your face does the thinking. Two to the skull, yet one gets up. Odds are against you, but they're just numbers after the two to one. You're playing the hand you've been dealt, but you don't let it rest. You shuffle and stack, and a gamble. A gamble that may pay off, but how? Forecast, rapidly changing conditions. A lot of thinking, most of it in your face. It's almost shouting at me. Sorry if I said anything weird. Holy cow! And suddenly we realize that the forecaster is legitimate. Without knowing a thing about the courier, he correctly saw into our past and predicted our future. Let's break down his prediction. Your face does the thinking, two to the skull, yet one gets up. This is a reference to the very beginning of the game when Benny shot us in the head. Two to the skull is the two bullets that the courier took to the skull. We only see one gunshot from Benny at the beginning of the game, but that's because the other one took place after we were already unconscious. The second bullet is confirmed elsewhere in the game, by Legatlanius, for example. I can see it upon your face, where two bullets left their mark. And also by Doc Mitchell when he mentions bullets, plural. But that don't mean them bullets didn't leave you nutter in the bighorn or drop it. The one getting up is, of course, the courier, despite the two bullets he or she still gets up. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that the forecaster can predict the future. After all, he could have simply seen the bullet scars on our face. After all, he said, your face does the thinking. So maybe he just correctly guessed what happened to us. Odds are against you, but they're just numbers after the two to one, is his way of saying that even though the odds are against us, one man or woman, trying to survive and write the fate of the Mojave, the fact that we survived 
two shots to the head means that we must have some sort of luck on our side. You're playing the hand you've been dealt. We were dealt a hand by Benny, and when we arise in Good Springs, we have to track him down and his con goons. But you don't let it rest, you shuffle and stack and gamble. This is foreshadowing to later in the game. After dealing with Benny, playing the hand we've been dealt, we shuffle and stack. We get a new deck. We choose a side, make alliances with new factions. And this choice, whom to side with in the game, is a big gamble. A gamble that may pay off? But how? This could be a reference to any of the endgame choices we make in the game. Is it a gamble to side with House, NCR, Legion, or even Yes Man? Yes Man may be the biggest gamble of all. If any of these sides pay off, how will they pay off? We don't really know until the end of the game, until all of our decisions have been made. Then the forecasters forecast rapidly changing conditions. Things in the Mojave are moving, moving swiftly. And after every quest we complete, every decision we make, the fate of the Mojave changes. After hearing his forecast, we can ask him, how do you know these things? Oh, I don't know anything, ma'am. I just think it. And then I don't. Well, great, that was helpful. Well, kid, here's another hundred caps. I want to hear your thoughts again. Sure, I could do some more thinking. What should I do my thinking about this time? This time, do your thinking about here. I need to take off my medicine. Local, local. The here and now. Little of interest. Things to buy. False hopes and regrets watered down. Washed down in dirty glasses. With regret comes a girl. Smiling sad. Brown robe. Name Veronica. Half here. Wraps her and her heart up like a pack. In the pack. A key, some say. Forecast. Cloudy with a chance of friendship. Ouch. Thinking small only hurts a little, but it's a sharp pain. This forecast refers to everything going on here at the 188 Trading Post. Local, local, the here and now. By here and now, he really does mean physically here and right now. Little of interest, things to buy. A simple reference to the many wonderful merchants we find here at the 188 Trading Post. One of these merchants is just above us, on the western side of the overpass, just south of an NCR tent. We find a merchant named Arms Merchant standing next to a truck. You a merc? Because you don't look like a prospector. Something like that. Are you an NCR soldier? Hell yes, ma'am. Well, not officially. Not anymore. They mustered me out a year ago. Administrative discharge. What was your rank? Staff Sergeant, 3rd Platoon, Bravo Company. I was at the dam when the Legion hit us three years back. That was a shitstorm, and don't let anybody tell you different. The brass try to play it down, but most of them were back at McCarran. Administrative discharge? What does that mean? It means my CO was an asshole and I told him to eat shit. He ordered me to flog a couple deserters. Those kids didn't desert. They just got liquored up on the strip and missed roll call. I don't know what else the brass expects. Half these kids don't get more than two weeks of training before they ship them out here. How did you end up selling weapons? Going home didn't feel right. Not with those savages camped on the other side of the river sharpening their knives. And I still get to see my old platoon when they pass through here. Make sure the new CEO is treating them right and sneak them extra ammo. Anyway... I was always complaining about the standard issue gear. The new kids don't even get body armor. Can you believe that? So I hooked up with a couple other vets. Bribed a gunrunner. Now we're supplying grunts, mercs, and anybody else on our side. We don't make much, but at least we're saving lives. NCR doesn't have the caps to outfit their troops? Vegas is bleeding us dry. We're tossing caps at a hundred different problems, while Caesar bides his time and lets us wear ourselves out. This war is going to bankrupt the NCR unless we finish off the Legion fast and dirty. We shouldn't be perched up at the dam. We ought to be crossing the Colorado and sticking a boot up Caesar's ass. You do a lot of business with prospectors? Sure do. Lots of folk been coming out east, sorting through junk, looking for whatever they can sell. Times are tough back home. Too many people, not enough work. Unless you like shoveling Brahmin shit. Can you show me what you have for sale? Sure, no problem. 
This unnamed arms merchant is one of the best merchants in the game. She has 8,000 caps to barter with, making her a wonderful vendor where we can get rid of some of that Sierra Madre gold. She sells many rare weapons, including some of the ones that we can get with the Gunrunner's Arsenal DLC. She also has quite an exotic selection of weapon mods. Ripper Carbide Teeth, Power Fist Chromed Tubes, Missile Launcher Guidance Systems, Katana Protective Sheaths? But her ammo selection is pretty meager. Though I did take the opportunity to snag all of the 308 rounds she had on her inventory. Perfect for this machine. The next excellent vendor we find here is under the overpass, close to the forecaster, right on the opposite side of the road. Here we find a small gunrunner shop, manned by the ever-pleasant Alexander. Is there some reason I should be talking to you? I don't like your attitude. You like it any better if I tell you to fuck off? What do you do? I'm a salesman. I swing through McCarran in the dam once a week or so to take orders. But lately, I spend most of my time in this piss heap. Ever since the 15th shut down, all caravans come through here, right to me. I check the stock and direct deliveries onward to meet orders. Sure, it stinks to hang out here, but it won't be forever. Plus, I can afford a monthly bender on the strip and still build up my nest egg. Can you tell me more about the Gunrunner caravans? Not much to tell. A Brahmin or two loaded up with weapons and a whole mess of well-armed guards to make sure it ends up where it's supposed to. One nifty bit, though. The gun cases are rigged to explode, so trying to loot one of our caravans doesn't do much good. And that's how the NCR stays equipped. The only thing we don't bring in is energy weapons. Why don't you deal in energy weapons? We used to, but every caravan carrying them was getting ambushed and wiped out. By someone sophisticated enough to know which was which. We think it was the Brotherhood of Steel. Those crazies always go hard for energy weapons. But the NCR would rather pretend they killed all of them. This is an admirable theory, but we know the real reason their caravans of energy weapons were sacked. And that's because they were attacked by the Van Graffs in conjunction with Crimson Caravan. To find out more about that story, you can watch my video on the Van Graffs by clicking here. So Alex, where can I buy some weapons? There's usually a gun merchant hanging around topside. I'm sure she'll take care of you. She sure can, but despite what he says here, he is a functional merchant. Let me see what you got for sale. Take a look. And his inventory is much more impressive. Like the arms merchant Topside, he also has a wide selection of weapons, including really powerful ones and weapons from DLCs and Gunrunner's Arsenal. And he has a completely different selection of weapon mods, many of which are pretty rare. Like the arms merchant, he has a cap stash of over 8,000, great for selling our gold, and he has a much larger selection of ammunition, including the 4570 government rounds needed for my medicine stick. The false hopes and regrets watered down, washed down in dirty glasses, is likely a reference to the bartenders, whom we find manning their bar topside. There are two bartenders. During the day, we find Michelle running the bar. Welcome to the 188 Slop and Shop. How can I help you? Who are you? Name's Michelle. My dad and me run this store. His name's Samuel. I take the day shift and he takes nights. We came here about a month ago, when Prim went to hell on account of the prison break north of there. Found a bin to call home and set up shop. Why'd you settle in this dump? There's more to the 188 than meets the eye. Troops move back and forth on 93 all the time, and 95 is how NCR folks come and go from Vegas. No shortage of customers, so long as Legion raids south of here don't get worse anyways. Why is this place called the 188? You do know these old roads were numbered, right? We're standing where the 95 and 93 meet. And 95 plus 93 equals 188. Clever, clever. What do you know about Legion raids? Not much. I hear some folks got killed down by Nelson. Or was it Novak? I don't know. If they come up this way, me and Dad will go someplace else. I'd like to see what you have for sale. Have a look. She's primarily an aid vendor, though she does have a selection of ammunition, and it's different from the other two merchants. If, however, we visit the bar at night, we find her alcoholic father behind the bar. Feeling thirsty? Who are you? Samuel Kerr at your service. Me and my daughter Michelle run this fine establishment. We came here from Prim about a month past. 
Doesn't look like much, but it's one hell of a location. Why'd you leave Prim? Michelle and I ran a little shop in Prim till a prison break north of town spoiled it for everyone. Goddamn convicts just about shut down I-15. When traffic dried up, we took to our heels to find us some customers. I'm not one to sit around waiting to get saved, and Michelle ain't neither. Why is business so good here? When 15 shut down, 95 became the route NCR citizens used to get to the Strip. Or limp back home. After the Strip's drained them of caps. We get them coming and going. Coming, the suckers flush with caps they saved to gamble on the Strip. And going, the same folks. But now they're losers who'll trade you the shirt off their backs so they don't starve before they make it back home. Add in the troopers marching back and forth from McCarran and the dam, and well, let's just say we don't miss Prim. I need something repaired. Let me see what I can do. But sadly, his repair skill is only 40. Not very useful. Can you show me what you got for sale? You bet. Like his daughter, he primarily deals in aid. However, unlike his daughter, he actually sells booze. She must not be a fan. He clearly is a fan. Wow, look at him go. Their shack is directly behind the bar, and they swap places at night. She sleeps here during the night, and he sleeps here during the day. We can verify the details of much of their story by exploring the overpass. Here we find a bunch of destitute travelers. I lost everything I had at the tops, but if you gave me 500 caps, I'd head straight back. Sick, huh? Can you spare some caps, ma'am? Can't help you. Oh, you could. You just don't want to. Sure, here's 25 caps. Sorry I had to bother you. I've... Well, I've lost everything. On the strip, everyone's nice to you when you got the caps. The moment you don't, they throw your ass out. These destitute travelers sleep in rusting wrecked caravans and on filthy mattresses. After meeting everybody, we better understand the forecaster's riddle. False hopes and regrets watered down, washed down in dirty glasses. False hopes refers to all of the travelers flush with money when they arrive in the Mojave, where they spend a lot of it at the 188, which is their first stop before they reach New Vegas. They arrive at the 188 with false hopes, hopes of winning big at the casinos. And then regrets watered down, washed down in dirty glasses, are the regrets of these very same people on their return trip. After blowing all their money in New Vegas, they return to the 188 with no money. They're so poor, they become destitute travelers. They can't afford real booze, so the booze is watered down. And then they wash their sorrows down in these dirty glasses. The next part, with regret comes a girl, smiling sad, brown robe, named Veronica. This, of course, is a reference to Veronica Santangelo. We meet Veronica on our first visit to the 188, standing right next to the bar, standing with regret. But this is a reference to both the regret of the people who lost their money in Vegas and the regret of Veronica herself. She's smiling sad. She wears a smile, has a cheery personality, but she is sad and lonely, feeling rejected by her own family. She may be physically here at the 188, but she's only half here. The other part of her, her heart, is back home. She wraps herself and her heart up like a pack. We meet her wrapped in these brown robes, but she's also wrapped up her personal story, the story contained in her heart, a story we don't learn until we take her on as a companion and complete her companion quest. And then his last bit, in the pack, a key, some say is literal. If we take Veronica on as a companion, she physically becomes the key to the Hidden Valley Bunker, a bunker we would have a very hard time accessing without her. With her as a companion, we get to skip an entire quest and she just allows us to walk right in. His forecast, cloudy with a chance of friendship. The details of Veronica's story are cloudy. The whole thing becomes even more murky once we arrive at Hidden Valley and meet the Brotherhood of Steel and begin to do their quests. But with all of this uncertainty, there is a chance of friendship. We can become a true blue friend for Veronica, but that's a story that I explored in my character profile all about Veronica, which you can watch here. The forecaster has one final forecast. We can ask him to do his thinking about everywhere. Let me take off my medicine. Bull and bear over the dam, at each other's throats. But a light from Vegas? Balls spinning on the wheel. 
more than two at the table, placing bets. All lose in different ways. A dam of corpses. Towns of corpses. Scattered across the sand. But whose? In what shares? Even the dealer doesn't know. Forecast? A rain of blood will flood the desert and not purify it. Blah. Thinking about everywhere always makes me feel a little sick. And this final forecast contains many references to the bigger plots of the game. Bull and bear over the dam at each other's throats. An obvious reference to both the Legion and the NCR fighting over Hoover Dam. And the next bit, but a light from Vegas? That, I think, may be House. If we side with House, he gives us a quest to restart the El Dorado power substation, which brings new light to Vegas. Also, it could be that House himself is a light, another way to solve the problem between the bull and the bear. Or maybe the light stands for hope, hope for an independent Vegas, an independent Vegas brought on by either Benny or the courier and yes man. Ball spinning on the wheel, more than two at the table, placing bets. This, I think, is a reference to Benny, House, the Yes Man, and possibly the Courier. More than two at the table. Benny, with his Yes Man, is placing bets on the same roulette table as House is. But of course, with Benny gone, we can now work with Yes Man. More than two at the table, House and the Courier partnered with Yes Man. This could also refer to all of the other minor factions whom we have to get allegiances from, whom we have to bring to the table during the later stages of the faction quests. The Boomers, the Great Khans, the Omertas, the White Glove Society, even the Enclave Remnants are all playing at the same roulette table. Then he says, all lose in different ways. A dam of corpses, towns of corpses, scattered across the sand. This correctly sums up that no matter which faction we ultimately side with in the game, everyone loses. There's no ending where everyone comes out right in the end. You side with the NCR, the Legion loses, and many of the people in the Mojave now have really uncomfortable taxes. You side with the Legion, the NCR loses, and many people in the Mojave are now enslaved. You side with House and Vegas wins, but the rest of the Mojave doesn't get anything. You side with Yes Man, Vegas is independent, but the roads of the Mojave can't be protected. The Brotherhood of Steel are either wiped out, forced into an alliance they don't like, or have to remain hidden forever. The Great Khans are either wiped out, used as tools by the Legion, lose their tribal identity, or, again, are forced into an alliance that they don't want. No matter who wins this game, someone will lose, and in different ways. The Dam of Corpses is, of course, a reference to the Second Battle of Hoover Dam, which is in our future. We can't avoid this battle. There will be war, and there will be corpses. Towns of corpses scattered across the sand is a reference to what the Omeritas were planning in New Vegas. Once the battle began, they had a scheme to release chlorine in Vegas, a plot which I uncovered in my video on the Omeritas that you can watch here. And these towns of corpses could also refer to Nipton, Nelson, all of the towns that the Legion has already sacked. Or if they win, all of the towns they will sack in the future. He finishes, but whose corpses are these? And in what shares? Even the dealer doesn't know. And that I think is a reference to the game developers at Obsidian, actually. Because the dealer of this game is not any major faction. It's not House, Yes Man, The Legion, or NCR. The dealer of this game is fate, or God, or the creators of this plot, Obsidian. Even the dealer doesn't know. Obsidian doesn't know the ultimate end of this game because the choice is up to the player. The decision is ours to make. But whose corpses and in what share will be scattered across the sand? We have to decide. Forecast a rain of blood will flood the desert and not purify it. I think this must be a direct response to Legion philosophy. They see themselves as the purifiers of the wasteland, calling everyone else profligates. They destroyed Nipton because it was a den of iniquity. Gamblers, prostitutes, backstabbers. They didn't see themselves as murderers. They saw themselves as cleansers. But if the forecaster is correct, it doesn't matter how much blood or whose blood is spilled. This bath of blood purifies nothing. And ultimately, it's a criticism of the entire second battle for Hoover Dam. 
there is no way to avoid a rain of blood. It will flood the Mojave Desert. But no matter whose blood is spilled, the Mojave doesn't come out the other end purified. It never will become perfect. That was pretty intense, Forecaster. Do you have any more thoughts that I can pay for? Sorry, ma'am. All that thinking has made my head hurt. I don't think I'll be doing any thinking for a long time. And with that, he heads over to his junk pile and sits down. So, did we just discover that psychics exist in the Fallout universe? Well, yeah. And no. On the one hand, everything that the forecaster told us could be gleaned without the need of psychic powers. When he talked about you, he made a simple observation based on what he saw. He saw the scars on our face. He knew we got shot twice in the head. And the rest of it was really vague. The odds are against you. You're playing the hand you were dealt. You're gambling, but will it pay off? All of that is accurate, depending on how we interpret it. But I think that could probably be accurate for almost anyone. So the forecaster didn't need psychic powers to give us his you forecast. And the same is true for the here forecast. All he told us is what we find here at the 188 trading post where he lives. He had plenty of time to learn that there were merchants here and to learn the stories of both Samuel and Michelle and overhear the regrets of all of the gamblers returning from Vegas. He had plenty of time to talk with Veronica or hear her spill her story to patrons of the bar. He could have easily discerned that she has a sensitive soul despite the mask she wears and that she ultimately seeks friendship. He has no need for psychic powers for his here forecast. But then we reach the everywhere forecast. Everyone knows about the bull and the bear, but a light from Vegas? A ball spinning at the wheel and more than two at the table? The forecaster would have to know about House and House's ambitions. And he would have to know about Benny's ambitions and Yes Man. The latter part of his everywhere forecast is also really vague. He didn't need psychic powers to tell us this. Where there is war, there are corpses. If there's war in the desert, there will be blood in the desert. None of that is impressive. But it is impressive that the forecaster knew about Benny and Yes Man. But it's not impossible that he overheard that as well. After all, it may be that Benny and the cons went through the 188 trading post on the way to Good Springs to murder the courier. And maybe there the forecaster overheard Benny talking to himself about Yes Man and his plot. Possible, but I think it's unlikely. Which means the forecaster really does have some sort of psychic power. But is that canon? It is. The forecaster is a psyker. Psychers appeared as early as Fallout 1. We find four psychers in the Master's Lair. They have some sort of psychic power. The device that we see on the forecaster's head also made an appearance in Fallout 1. It's called a psychic nullifier. The forecaster wears the only one in the game. We can't pickpocket or otherwise use it. Its sole purpose is to block psychic energy so that the forecaster doesn't have headaches. Psychers have appeared in one way or another in every Fallout game. In Fallout 3, the Ant Agonizer has psychic control over ants, and as we recall from the Point Lookout DLC, Professor Calvert could communicate telepathically, and he had some sort of psionic power. And of course, in Fallout 4, there's Mama Murphy, who, very similar to the Forecaster, was able to predict the Soul Survivor's future using riddles. She didn't have a psychic nullifier, but in order to gain the sight, she did have to get dosed up on chems. Maybe the chems worked in a similar way that the psychic nullifier did. So what is the nature of psychers? Well, that is a rather broad topic, and it likely deserves its own video. We'll talk about that another time on another day. But that is the full story of the Forecaster from Fallout New Vegas. 
Did you meet the forecaster in your game? How did you interpret each of his riddles? Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. I publish many new Fallout videos each and every week, so if you want to make sure you don't miss my next episode, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. I take Sundays off, so I'm not going to have a video for you Monday, but never fear, I'll be back Tuesday morning with a brand new video. I have a shirt shop where you can find completely unique designs that you can't find anywhere else. My shirts come in a variety of both men's and women's sizes, and in a wide array of colors. The designs also come on other products besides shirts, smartphone cases, mugs, posters, prints, etc. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you Tuesday morning, bright and early, with a brand new video.